everyone. Uh, Charlotte Klein here again. Um, as you know, I'm the producer um, at 60 Hour Shakespeare and also the producer for the upcoming production of Richard II on Monday, uh, the 31st of August, this bank holiday Monday. Um, as you've seen from our social media accounts, um, as part of this year's production, we are speaking to various people within the industry. We're raising money this time for Acting for Others, um, a wonderful charity that supports theatre workers through 14 member charities. I'm really, really delighted to be joined here today with Colin Hurley. Colin Hurley is an actor and former member of the Royal Shakespeare Company, the National Theatre and also the Globe. We're really, really lucky to have him joining us today. Hi Colin, how are you? Good, thanks. Yeah, not bad at all. And whereabouts are you streaming from at the moment? Dulwich, South East London. Dulwich, okay, so very local. Um, and obviously I've given you a bit of an intro, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about yourself and particularly how you came into acting into Shakespeare. Uh, it started a long, 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 long time, 40 odd years ago. I, I was persuaded uh, by some mates. I was quite geeky at school, very quiet, not sporty. Um, my equally geeky mates said, um, oi, oi, we're doing a play with the girls school. It was a boys school, so I hadn't actually spoken to a member of the opposite sex for about five years. Um, and suddenly there was a chance to mingle with these, these exotic creatures that I'd heard so much about. We were doing a, a school play together with the girls' school up the road. Uh, but even then I needed a lot of persuading. Uh, so we did that, we did, um, we did As You Like It. And I, I was only playing a tiny part, but just really enjoyed the attention, if I'm honest. And, and through that got hooked. Yeah, yeah, I did it again, then again. There was a fantastic um, teacher up there called Paul Ward, who just, he was like a gardener. He, you know, everyone just flowered under this guy. <laughs> so much love and attention and encouragement. And so, uh, so I stayed in touch with him, even though he wasn't my teacher. And, and he helped me a lot over the next couple of years. And I think that's, it's so funny just speaking to everyone. I mean, it seems like behind every great actor, there's always a wonderful mentor or theatre teacher, like you say, behind them that sort of brought them into to the world and kind of took them under their, their wings. Um, you've obviously gravitated towards Shakespeare kind of throughout your professional career. I mean, what kind of keeps you coming back for more Shakespeare? It's what I get offered. It's, <laughs> it's I did some Shakespeare very early on and then people won't go, oh, that's what he does. I mean, for a while, but in the old days, when there used to be like a repertory system and there were theatres all over the country, I'd be typecast as different things in different towns. You know, so I'd, I'd go to Salisbury to do some comedy and, and Leatherhead to do something else. And um, the Shakespeare just kept cropping up a lot. I, I'm not, a, I'm not, I've never thought of myself as, uh, I'm certainly not a scholar and I'm not that knowledgeable about it, but I've done so many of his plays now but um, I just feel like um, that, that's what I do. I also got in, in very involved when I was at the Globe, and I've been working at the Globe on and off since, um, since 2001. I, I got very involved in the education side of things there, running workshops right down from kind of primary school, right up to university students, and then carried on working with, um, with teachers. It's, they've got a fantastic department there. You know, um, they'd, they'd have all, all these schemes where a group of teachers would come over from New Zealand or come over from America and spend two or three weeks with us and we'd just give them everything we got basically. The, the, the emphasis being on practical approaches. Yep. Uh, the thing about sitting there reading a Shakespeare play that is very soporific so we and and it's not what he what he meant them to be you know he didn't mean them to be sat there um, in a classroom so it, it, was, it was a joy to be able to just share some um, exercises I guess rooted in, in how we might rehearse a play, if you're lucky, mm. uh, and, and then just getting the bodies in the space and seeing how much, how much easier it is to understand the Shakespeare play if you're actually hearing. The words were designed to go in the ears rather mm. than the eyes, is what I often say. I mean, as I'm sure you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, there, there are obviously a lot of readings of Shakespeare. And one of the things we ask our cast is to kind of be off book and to sort of stand up in the performances and kind of be like a space. Because as you said, it's meant to be acted. It can't be static. And 
um, I hope all of the, the cast are watching this now to, to, to hear for it firsthand from an actor. And obviously, I mean, I'm just dying to hear, because obviously, as you said, you've worked at the Royal Shakespeare Company, National Theatre and the Shakespeare's Globe. How does it vary, you know, their approaches to Shakespeare? You mentioned that obviously the Globe has a very practical approach and also incorporates these wonderful education programmes. You know, is there a style or any, anything that sort of varies one by one and, and brings you back? Uh, it, it's quite hard for me to separate out um, different styles of different places from my own development, really. Uh, when, I, when I did plays at the, at the National and the RSC, I was young, I was a bit chippy. I was playing kind of smallish parts at the National, then small to medium at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And um, it wasn't until I came to the Globe and met uh, a couple of very particular right people a bit like with the drama teacher, uh, Paul Ward, and a couple of my English teachers. Suddenly there was the right person there, right in front of me, to, to help me um, move up to the next level, to develop again. I got a bit stuck. I think when, when I arrived, um, it was, it was a man called Tim Carroll was the first person that I worked with at the Globe. And uh, with this strange encounter, I was, I was going in to read for, uh, I think, either Macduff or Banquo, they weren't quite sure, in the Scottish play. And I met him and I, I'd, I'd been thinking about giving up acting quite regularly up to that point. But I went in and uh, we read a bit and, and I stopped halfway through a scene. I went, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm, <clears throat> I just don't think I could take myself seriously playing Banquo or Matt. <laughs> and, and this total stranger at the time, Tim, just kind of looked at me quite cross, some stupid actor. And said, so, so, so what could you take yourself seriously playing then? Um, and I said, and I, <laughs> I just, I remember kind of going, oh, I don't know. Uh, one <laughs> and um, we read a bit more, left, and um, we had a mutual friend. I, I just worked with a lad who he'd worked with earlier. And so I thought, well, this is a bit of a strange interview, but I, I phoned up this lad, Will. I said, I just met this guy called uh, Tim Carroll. Um, I don't know, uh, th th there was something going on there, but... Um, I just want to check with you, is he a bit of a dick? And Will said, I've just put the phone down to Tim Carroll, who said exactly the same to me. He said, I've just met this Colin Hurley, is he a bit of a dick? Uh, and so this lad, uh, Will, kind of put us together. He was our, our matchmaker. You know, he reassured us both that, that even though we were both a bit of a dick, we'd probably get on quite well. <laughs> and uh, that was sort of the beginning of a love affair. Even then though, I was, I was quite unhappy. The job of acting does make you unhappy sometimes, um, or you make yourself unhappy anyway. Um, and so I'd, give, I'd made a deal with myself. I thought, okay, well, I'll, I'll go there. I, I, was, I was third witch or something. Um, but if I'm, if I'm as unhappy as I think I might be at the end of the first week, I'll just have to hand back my wage packet. And I'll have to say, I'm really sorry. It's a terrible mistake. I shouldn't be an actor anymore. And, and so that was the deal I'd made with myself. I'll give it one week. And I wouldn't spend my wages until the Friday and I might just hand them back. This is in the old days when you got paid in cash. Oh yeah, in the little envelope. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was five days of just heaven. It was fantastic. Day one, um, I think Tim said, oh, let's, um, I don't know, let's run the play. Uh, and he said, oh, well, let's see, um, I know, everyone's in every scene. And so we ran the play and everyone had to be in every scene and justify it. And I think the next day we, we ran the play, but if you're speaking, you had to be carrying a chair. And then I think there was, we ran the play and you weren't allowed to be on the ground if you were speaking. It just all sorts of fun and games. And uh, so at the end of the, end of the first week, uh, my money stayed yeah. in my pocket. Right on, yeah. I, I, I often refer to myself as a born again actor. And uh, that, was, that was when I was born again, if you like. Yeah. Uh, suddenly it, it all made sense. Suddenly I, I'd met someone who's, I spent a lot of time meeting very talented, very clever people that I couldn't quite connect with. And I thought, oh, that's just because I'm not clever or talented or right enough. You know, I'm not a proper actor. Uh, and then suddenly I was, I'd met these people and I just seemed to fit a bit better. They didn't mind the stupid things I carried around with me. Mm -hmm. and, and it was very freeing. So sometimes, you know, if you're struggling with with your work or whatever, it might just be that you haven't met the right people yet, I think. So um, have a look at that. 
Yeah, absolutely. And the right company. And, and yeah, just, I mean, it's like having a football team, right? You've got to all corporate and you've got to have that same energy that you bring. Um, I guess just to follow from that, you obviously, with your experience, have met so many different people, I imagine, that work in the theatre industry. And obviously, we're going through this, this crazy time, this unprecedented time at the moment. I mean, I wish we could be doing this interview in person. Um, and yet, you know, so much of... Um, so much of the theatre industry has been impacted by the pandemic. We've had closures, we're, you know, limited live gatherings. And, you know, how, how what personal stories do you have to come out of this, this lockdown? How have you been affected? Um, how have the people that you work with been affected? Well, obviously, there's no theatre. Um, <clears throat> I, was, I was working at the time. I stepped in for someone at the Globe. We were doing a production of Taming of the Shrew. And they had to give us our notice. As when the theatres were closed down. So I got paid for four weeks, which is better than a lot of my friends. Um, and then when that stopped, um, since, since sort of January, February, I've, I've managed to do two workshops. I've delivered two workshops online. I got a day on a radio, which was a big surprise. And then some American friends asked me if I, could, if I wanted to be involved with them. They decided to read all of Shakespeare's plays on Zoom. Uh, starting with The Tempest and working their way back. And they were doing them three times a week. So we'd rehearse and then do it. Um, so I did that with them for a while. I read about half of them. And that, that earned me, I think, $180 for about two months' work. I edited some of the plays as well. So I kept busy, but I wasn't really earning any money. And then recently, an another friend got in touch and said, we're doing this strange um, um, virtual... Um, promenade performance, a sort of response to Twelfth Night. So, so these friends, um, the, the Shakespeare Ensemble, they call themselves, uh, got nine actors, a bit like yourself, you know, all over the country. You know, we've got someone in India, someone in Canada, someone in, in, in France, someone in Wales, me in England. Uh, and we all simultaneously performed a 45 minute piece that we devised. Each of us was given a character. And then people could just kind of flip from, from room to room, if you like. I mean, they have a little map of Illyria and they could sort of see how Malvolio is doing and then pop over and see what to Toby Belch is up to or have them um, playing simultaneously. So and that, that was, a, that was a, a fun project to do and really got the juices going. Again, it's not going to it's not going to pay the bills. But I feel like I've done a lot of learning. Um, and I'd love to know kind of your take on how the industry has been affected and, and how, how you think uh, different people within the industry are dealing with it. Yeah, it's, um, I think from the outside, it seems very simple. Oh, just put on some new plays or, or some cheap plays. You know, why don't you just, um, you know, do something? And uh, I mean, the, the theatre that I'm closest to is the Globe, Shakespeare's Globe. And... Uh, I realise that it's, it's not that simple. It's, it's, it's really difficult to, to negotiate all the, the rules and regulations and what's legal and what's not legal and what's financially viable. Uh, I think all the theatres nowadays, the, you know, the big ones, uh, it takes a lot of money just to run the building before you start putting any shows on. And, and shows aren't money cows, they're not cash cows. You know, they, it, it tends to just kind of... If, you, if it works really well, you, may, you come out a bit ahead, but it, it's not a place to, to make a killing, really, usually. So um, I, I think there's this strange thing where at first we had lots of enthusiasm and people were racking their brains, what can we do? And people being very generous, I think, you know, um, trying to support, if, if they could, they'd support financially uh, some of these places. And then the government, um, I mean, I've benefited from the government giving us the, um, the self-employment um, income support. Uh, that's, you know, <clears throat> without that, I don't know what I'd have done, really. And it's, it's not often I've got much <laughs> nice to say about the government, but, you know, I have to, I have to thank them for that. But then they, there's this announcement of this a massive amount of money being given to the arts to support all these theatres. And, and I think that's had a, a huge effect on people's perception of the, um, the need for, for continued support. And so donations, uh, from what I can gather, have plummeted. Since the, since the, the government announced this money, uh, everyone's gone, oh, well, they don't need any money now. And, and donations have just dropped rock bottom now. And, and 
the reality is that the money that once it's all divided up, the money that the government government do give, if you know um, when, when they decided who gets what, won't be enough even to keep the buildings running still. So it's 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 getting very very tight. I mean, me, you know, I'm I'm a freelancer. It's certainly right. I I chose not to have a steady job, but there are lots of people who've, who've you know given their lives to um, to a particular place. And, and, and stayed somewhere and it's it's tough really tough these goalposts have moved you know right off the pitch for these folk and there is this thing that if any of these if these uh, buildings or companies if they go then they won't come back you know you, you can't unscramble the eggs and stick yeah. them back in a shell yeah. so it's 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 worrying but then you know the, it's always been worrying for the arts it's, it, 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 it was all, it always used to be better, Liz, but but it does feel like it just gets tighter and tighter and tighter, and we just have to get used to it in some ways. But it, but it's a serious um, it's a serious uh, reduction in 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 what what can't be can't be measured quite. You can't say oh we've saved these lives and oh we've produced this amount of goods to you know to um, to, to make the the economy stronger. But there's a but there is a massive cost if you if you squeeze the arts too much, and and people don't realise it at first, but but it hurts. Absolutely, and I think it's you know it's something a lot of people take for granted having that and having that sheer diversity in the amount of theatre and productions, and not just you know the bigger theatres, but also the fringe and the the kind of the smaller projects. And as you say, it's just spread very very finely, and and you know there's a huge industry and, and a huge amount of jobs. I think I was reading somewhere that 5,000 jobs have been lost in the UK because of coronavirus. And that I think it's something like 70% um, you know, of, of people that work in the, the theater industry are freelance. So you know, to your point, just that kind of that lack of that safety net, net and that, that safety blanket. If we want the, the arts to return in the, you know, the form that we expected, that we were used to, I guess, back in January you know, this year, it's so important that we raise this money and that, that we really support it because we all love going to, to the theatre. We love having the diversity. I mean, for someone living in London, just the amount of productions and shows to choose from. Yeah, that requires a lot of not only effort, a lot of passion, a lot of people, but also a lot of, lot of money to, to support. So it's, it's definitely a good cause. I feel like we've gone kind of um on a kind of a bit of a negative note so i guess on a positive note have you seen anything good come out of lockdown i mean it sort of forced us to act in very new and unexpected ways i mean how how have how have you seen different theater companies adapt um groups of mates have been in touch and um i've been involved in a couple of projects that i wouldn't have normally suddenly doing play readings you know with American friends and then working on a piece that involved people from all over the world. I, you know, I, I, I did, um, there's a company called Creation who are quite good at the tech and uh, they're based in Oxford and I got involved in a production of theirs a few years back and it was a promenade performance and it needed, it involved using this thing called a smartphone uh, <laughs> and, and a thing called an app which is actually called WhatsApp and they had to train me up bless them. <laughs> they, had to, they, had to, they had to give me a phone first okay. and then show me how to use WhatsApp so we could warn people when groups were, were arriving on your street or whatever. And the number of times that I renamed the group, sent inappropriate <laughs> messages, lost groups, all sorts of things happened. But, you know, bless them, they, you know, they, they stuck with me. And, and I kind of, gosh, since then, I've just had to, I've had to get involved with Zoom and for all that I'm not keen on, it's very imperfect as a means of communication. It's all we've got. And then seeing the possibilities with like you kids, what you can do with, with, with so little is, is fantastic. So, and I've, I've got to spend time with my own kids as well. I've had to be sitting there while they do their maths and their English, which is a kind of hell. <laughs> I can imagine and it's I almost like you're reliving it yourself. Yeah, well, funnily, I'm quite interested in the subject, but the resistance <laughs> from the, the, the my ten year old Alfie, you know, who, who normally is quite nice, normally, but getting getting to sit down in front of that computer for the wrong reasons, you know, it's not a game, it's not Fortnite, um, it was horrendous. 
but you know we've, we've spent a lot of time together and at first I, I did complain I was going oh this isn't quality time it's quantity time mm. but I've changed my mind since then I've gone well you know we've put in the hours and and things do settle in a different way so so the gift it didn't you know it wasn't wrapped up looking like a gift but there, there have been gifts there definitely in terms of just being forced to hang out with your with, with your family in a different way yeah yeah that's and kind of get connected and I hope I guess one of the things that comes out is some of these groups that have now met online you know through love of Shakespeare through love of theatre through love of homework I don't know but um you know I hope that some of that keeps up because I mean we do a Shakespeare reading group that's sort of every Tuesday and you know through that we we used to do it in a pub in London and now we have it online and we get different people from all over the world and it's actually just interesting hearing different takes how performances might have been done in India or we had someone join from the US and you know it's a really nice I think you know obviously it's not going to replace the, the being in person and, and living a play together but actually in terms of at least I think in some of the analysis and just talking about it I mean it was meant to be discussed it was meant to be analyzed and, and chatted through and you know I, I really hope some of that changes um yes, I guess there's you know, much, sorry there's, there's an enforced cultural exchange going on. that's been happened, hasn't it uh, and I, I really appreciate it because I'm quite lazy yeah that way. I don't want to go on holiday particularly um so it's nice that holiday comes to me and different cultures come to me and different ways of thinking. Yeah. I need a <laughs> Just different backgrounds. I mean, you can go anywhere now. <laughs> um, and I guess to, to bring it back to Shakespeare, obviously with your amazing experience, I mean, we're doing Richard II. I mean, what's your take on the play? Have you got any, have you been in the performance before or? I've never been allowed. Never been allowed <laughs> in Richard II. Too oh, dangerous. We should have known you would be available for our production. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, homework and stuff. Uh, it, it's fantastic, isn't it? There's, it's just a wonderful story. This, this, um, how something can come from nothing. You know, all that trouble comes from a bit of ineffectual leadership. With a, you know, there's a feud going on. Uh, I mean, so I'm talking about the story of the play rather than history. Mm -hmm. um, and just because just he makes a mess of that, he sows all the seeds for all these problems later, and gets a bit greedy, and then a bit careless, and a bit wafty and then that's that amazing scene where he basically hands over the crown mm. and he's so busy being the star of his own movie that, that he forgets there's a, there's a job he should have been doing and again what happens a lot in Shakespeare plays that when someone hits rock bottom they, they, they what they get in reward for all the everything that's been ripped away from them is is a kind of wisdom and a kind of peace so that beautiful speech where he's on his own and just dividing his little cell up and, and making a kingdom of that is uh, it's, it's just it's, it's an extraordinary journey to be taken on um, philosophically, if you like. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, it's funny, isn't it? This thing, the label that these plays are given, they're, they're called the history plays. And I don't know, I think I can limit our expectations a bit. So Colin, you know, given your background, I mean, do you have any advice for us embarking on Richard II? Oh, I have no advice, no, but I, I just say you're doing the right thing by limiting the rehearsal time. Um, that's, that's already tapping into the energy that would have been around in those days when it was a new play. They had very limited time. So you're thrown back on yourself. You, you know you've got some words and you'll try and remember them. So that's a fixed place. And then everything else is fluid, isn't it? Thank you so much. Um, really, I mean, it's just been wonderful speaking just now and, and thanks all for all the experience and the, the insight that you've given us. Um, just a reminder for those of you who are watching, uh, Richard II will be available to stream uh, live via YouTube um, on Monday the 31st of August at 7.30 British Summertime.